Hi, it's Paul from Hen Herbivore. I'm going to show you how to grow muscle on a vegan diet. It's 2017 people, wake up, ignorance still abounds, people thinking that you can't build muscle on a vegan diet, people obviously have not seen the likes of Patrick Baboumian, Barney DuPlessis, Nimai Delgado, Kendrick Farris, Jahina Malik, the list goes on, world class vegan strength athletes. There are so few vegans in the world, relatively speaking, there were already so many vegan world class athletes. Wake up people. A whole foods vegan diet is not just viable for bodybuilding, it is in fact optimal. This may sound crazy to a lot of you because we've been brainwashed since day one, but any essential nutrient and animal products came from plants in the first place. Anatomically, physiologically, biochemically, psychologically, we are not meant to eat animals or the things that come out of them. I spent 23 years training as an omnivorous bodybuilder. I spent the last five years training as a vegan bodybuilder. Take it from me, it's so much better. More energy, faster recovery, it's amazing. Don't just listen to the masses, people who have not been there, just following the same BS that they learned from Fred down the road. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna share with you my 28 years of experience, what I've learned, how to grow muscle. Number one tip is sacrifice. You must train, you must eat, you must rest and sleep, you, know, you must recover. If any of those are not in order, none of it's gonna work. So it's really sacrifice. You can't go out partying all the time and under recover. You know, you can't skimp on sessions because you may be a little tired that day. And you need to get your nutrition and you need to plan. To fail to prepare is to prepare to fail. If you're going out, You've not got nutrition with you, it's just potluck whether you can get a decent amount of food or the right food in. In the mornings, I'm, while I'm making my food, my breakfast, my food for the gym is, is on to cook, a couple of meals. Happily, my partner Gemma makes my evening meal uh, typically for me. But number one, sacrifice. Put everything in place, make sure you're doing it. Make it a priority. If you want to grow muscle, you need to be in a slight caloric surplus. What that means is you're eating slightly more calories than you're expending, so on a weekly basis, your body weight will be going up slightly. If you've no idea how many calories you need, you can look up basal metabolic rate calculator on the internet. You punch in your sex, your height, uh, your age, and it gives you a rough ballpark figure of how many calories you probably need at rest just to maintain your body weight. It's not amazing because it doesn't take into account you know, how lean or how overweight you are in terms of body fat. But it's a nice little ballpark figure which you can then play around with. You need to add a multiplier. This is called the Harris-Benedict equation. So you can look up that as well on, on Tinternet. Uh, and you add that multiplier to your basal metabolic rate and that tells you a ballpark figure how many calories you need to maintain. And then if you want to grow muscle, obviously you need to be in that slight surplus. How much lean mass you can gain in a week, you know, that's hard to say. If you're a raw beginner, if you're untrained, relatively young, you know, you might be able to put on quite a bit of muscle mass without putting on too much fat. If you've been training long term, you know, your, your gains are going to be fairly minimal. So you need to decide like how, how aggressively you want to go at it, how much fat you're willing to put on. Obviously bodybuilders typically do a gain in cycle and then a cut to bring any extra fat off, but that's really trial and error, so you have to just find out for yourself. The way to track your progress in terms of body weight is to get some decent bathroom scales that can do small increments, so either 0.1 or at least like quarter of a pound or 0.1 of a kilo, something like that. In the morning, you go to the loo, hop on the scales before you eat or drink. This is called your true weight, and this is what we want to track week by week under the same conditions. You then see what your body weight's doing, and then you trim your calories up or down accordingly. If you're not very good with calories yet, I can recommend the Chronometer app. 
and this is free on a computer. I think it's about two pounds forty nine for the the phone app, and it tracks your food and the macros and calories, even tracks your micronutrients. So it's nice, especially if you're a new vegan. Just make sure you're getting all the different food groups, getting all your different micronutrients in. So after making sure you're in that slight caloric surplus whereby your body weight is going up, we need a bare minimum of protein as well, obviously to, to build the muscle. The maximum required, which showed no further benefit, you know, after going as high as this, the studies really said 1.6 to 1.8 grams of protein per kilo of lean body weight which is a lot different from total body weight, especially if you're 50% fat, you know, so bear that in mind. You may not need as much as 1.6 to 1.8 grams per kilo. Much under that, you may be retarding your progress a little bit, you don't know. So, is it helpful to smash in loads of protein? Possibly not. Probably not so bad, plant protein, definitely versus animal protein though. So, you know, do you want optimal health? Do you want to risk not gaining as quickly as you perhaps could do? So that's up to you really, but play around with that and just make sure if your weights are going up every week, if you're not overly sore, you've got enough protein going in basically. In terms of macro splits, many can work in terms of growing ma muscle mass. However, for optimal health, I advocate more of a high carb, lower fat approach. By this I mean no more than about 15% of total calories from fats. However, if we're on really low calories, I like to look for at least a minimum of 20 grams for a female and 30 grams of total fats for a male, just in terms of making sure we've got enough for hormonal development. Of course, after the protein and the fats, the remainder is carbohydrate, which tends to be the most nutrient-rich food, you know, it's your fruits and veggies. Some people advocate the if it fits your macro style of thinking whereby you just get your protein, carbs, fat and you don't worry about micronutrients and you know this might work in the short term in terms of muscle growth but it's not optimal. We do need micronutrients to, to grow muscle and also you know do you just want to be big or do you want to be big and really healthy and maintain that over the long term you know it's a no-brainer for me whole foods plant-based diet versus if it fits your macros and just eat any old rubbish for a larger strength athlete on whole foods plant-based perhaps it would be a benefit to add in one or two scoops of um, a protein powder or a little tofu seitan tempeh you know the the higher protein foods if not it would be hard to get potentially as much protein as maybe optimal unless we're only eating beans and lentils and chickpeas you know the, the legumes you know and that could get boring pretty quick so I think the judicious use of a little bit of processed foods in an abundance of whole plant foods yeah it's not optimal for health but it's not going to kill you. Recommended supplements D3 which we should get from the sun if you're not lucky enough to be living in the tropics. Um, probably 2,000 IUs a day when you're not getting any direct sort of sunlight. It's, uh, it's actually a hormone that's responsible for 3,000 odd metabolic processes in our body. For a bodybuilder, it actually uh, lowers our sex hormone binding globulin, which means we have more free testosterone. So it's a bit like taking anabolic steroids, except that it's not harmful and it's just putting back what we should have because we evolved our physiology in the tropics with the sun on us all year round. B12, you know, for the manufacture of red blood cells, how much oxygen we can deliver to our muscles while we're training predicates, you know, how much uh, energy we've got for working out. So that's really important. It also metabolizes protein, carbs and fat into ATP, into energy. So that's another definite one to have in the mix. As for the other supplements, I don't think there's a lot of benefit to most of them. A lot of it is just marketing hoopla. It's a good phrase, wasn't it? Uh, creatine works in about 70% of people. Vegans will be lacking exogenous creatine because it comes from eating the flesh of animals. However, we produce our own, like the animals did, from the plant food. So when we put in exogenous um, creatine, we shut down making our own creatine, so after five, eight weeks, we have to come off it, let the receptors clear, and then start again. So for me, I would love, rather have a linear progression all the way through my training year, rather than have to 
keep lowering my weights just because I've got this artificial thing going on. And there's no long-term safety um, data on creatine because it's not been out that long. So I say why risk it, but it may be a benefit to your performance if that's more important to you than the potential health consequences. Branch chain amino acids, it's all in your food. You don't need the all um, aminos in, in isolation. Just get your decent whole foods based protein in there. Pre-workouts full of carcinogenic additives like this bright blue fizzy stuff that tastes like I don't know what. The odd couple of times I've had it since I've gone on a whole foods plant based diet, it's just given me terrible diarrhea and stomach upsets and I've felt sick. It's not meant to be in our bodies. For me, beetroot juice, um, 140 mils seems to be optimal for most people. However, my, my thinking is I'm a bit larger than most people, so maybe I can benefit from more. So I actually train five times a week. So if I get a litre um, carton of beetroot juice, I'll have 200 mils five times a week. Two to three hours pre-workout is uh, what the science is telling us. And it's a vasodilator, it just we have more stamina, we can train like harder and longer. That is a definite boost. Your veins come up as well, which is uh, important to us for some uh, reason. We like to look nice and vascular. For me, I use caffeine pre-workout. There's pros and cons to caffeine. There are a lot of studies saying there are health benefits. However, it is a neurotoxin, so our body is trying to get it out, which is why it gives you, you look sweating and your, your heart rate goes up. It's, you, basically, your body is trying to eliminate it, so whether or not you want to use it. It does about six things to boost performance. Uh, people say it is the most effective non-illegal bodybuilding supplement. You know, it's focus, drive, energy, pain reduction, actually. So, I like to, if you're gonna use it, have a decent dose, you know, 45 minutes or whatever pre-workout. Try not to use it at other times if you can help it. You know, it raises your cortisol, which is a stress hormone, which doesn't help your recovery. It's my bugbear, to be honest. I do struggle with caffeine because I've used it so much and then you become sort of reliant on it. So I wish I'd never got started on it, but I do, I do use it. Water. The one nutrient you can't go more than about three days without, the one nutrient that we all forget. So the majority of body is made from water. Muscles should be about 70% water by weight. A 3% loss of, you know, a 3% dehydration in the body leads to a 10% loss in strength. It's also very important in energy. And uh, yeah, get that in you. Make sure you're peeing clear like all throughout the day. Just keep smashing that in. Meal frequencies and timings. There's been a lot of rubbish talked about um, this, which I used to adhere to all my, all my training life. And then the last five years since I've gone vegan, I've realized most of it is complete fallacy. And we're just repeating the lies that we've been told. As long as you're getting all your calories in by the end of the day, I think that's more important than like, how many meals. I used to eat eight meals a day which is a pain, you have to keep stopping what you're doing, you know. I currently eat four meals, I would rather eat three if I could, but I eat so much low calorie vegetables for the health benefits, you know, so much water and fiber that I'm, you know, four feed a day is really a minimum for me to get that in. So typically it is the four, so I have kind of a three hour gap between each meal. However, I would, I would, advice to have a meal at least one before going to the gym so you're more fueled up and I like to wait at least one and a half to two hours pre-workout so that the food is not sitting in my stomach it's actually in the small intestine and more than that it is uh, seeping into my bloodstream it is actually fueling me so a lot of people uh, I see rush into the gym they pick up something on the way it's going to be sitting in their stomach till long after they leave the gym and it's just making them uncomfortable if you were to struggle like that, you know, like a liquid, something liquid with some uh, energy, like that's gonna get to work a, a hell of a lot faster. Post-workout, I like to eat fairly sharpish. Your hormones are set up such that you can replenish your energy. You wanna shuttle your hormones, testosterone and things into the, the, working, the muscles that you've just worked. So post-workout, trying to eat fairly sharpish. Now recovery. If you're going to the gym and smashing the hell over every time, you need balance in life, so you need downtime. Number one, adequate sleep. You know, around eight hours seems to be optimal for most people. Make sure it's good quality sleep. 
Make sure you're getting some rest in. Maybe meditation is great as well. The harder you're working, the harder you need to rest as well to just maintain that equilibrium. Now training. If you're new to the gym, consider hiring a PT, even if it's just for a couple of sessions, just for the acquisition of technique. If you're lifting badly, you know, you open yourself to injury and you're not going to get the most from your training. So that's a really good little tip, kind of a cheat code, if you will. Now programming. It's very easy in the first instance, especially if we're really excited um, to get cracking. It's easy to overdo it. Maybe we train seven days a week, maybe we train like twice a day, like loads and loads of curls because we want big biceps, chest pressing. And we just get overly sore, we under recover, we end up just giving up because we think, no, it's not for us, it don't work. You've got to be sensible in your approach. There needs to be a balance between frequency, how many times in a week you're training the body part, volume, you know, how many sets and reps you're doing. There's so many variables, but basically we, we need to have balance either go to a professional or go to a reputable source of online, you know, like a, a decent training program, not one that advocates a ton of work that would kill a rhino. And just because like um, a Mr. Olympia is saying that that's what he did, don't think I will just copy him. You know, he's genetically gifted, he's chemically enhanced. It's, it's just gonna kill you, you know, you're just gonna train yourself into the ground. So yeah, be clever in your program. If you want a real basic uh, beginner's plan, I'd say for the first couple of years, most people, probably three times a week, upper body push, upper body pull, leg split. So on the push day, we're doing chest, shoulders, triceps. On the pull day, we're doing upper back, perhaps spinal erectors, uh, biceps, rear delts, traps. And legs day, obviously, is uh, everything from, from your hips down. So pick one or two compound moves at the start of the session. On push day, we want some sort of a chest press or a dip, like a wide dip. Uh, some sort of a shoulder press. I would recommend doing uh, a wider version, so dumbbells or some sort of a machine, just so that we're targeting the shoulder width. You know, if we do like a military press, we're targeting the anterior deltoid, which gets a lot of work in your chest presses anyway, so why, why not work on the width? After that, you want some isolation work on the chest, um, on the delts and on the triceps. On the upper body pull day, it's pull-ups, pull-downs, rows, and um, pick a couple or three of those. Some rear delt work, some traps, some biceps. And leg days, kind of a squat movement pattern, lunges, leg press, I pick a couple of those. Stiff-legged deadlift, so we're training the upper hamstrings. Uh, and then some isolation work, so things like leg extensions, some sort of a leg curl, and some sort of direct calf work. Rep ranges for most things, for hypertrophy, for muscle growth, it seems that kind of six to 12 reps is about optimal. On movements with a smaller range of motion, so things like calf raise, wrists, um, shrugs, you can maybe double the reps because we need more time under tension to elicit the hypertrophy and really about 18 total sets, um, much more than that, probably you're diluting your effort and you, you're overtraining. Uh, as you get more advanced, you can get away with more work as your body becomes a, um, conditioned to it. If you're doing that three day split, I'd maybe program it so you've got a day off in between so you get the most recovery from your central nervous system. Consider some cardio on your off days or perhaps weight training AM, cardio PM. You can do cardio after your weight training, but you're kind of blunt in the hormonal response, so you won't get the most optimal gains from your training. Some people skip cardio altogether, and I see why they're sort of saving all their energy and recovery for their weights. However, the better our cardiovascular system works, the better we can deliver nutrients and hormones to the muscles, the better we can take away waste products like lactic acid, so maybe a false economy. And now my number one most vital piece of bodybuilding equipment well, it's two things, pen and pad, logbook. Write down your workout, log your exercises, sets, reps, and weights. And on a weekly basis, we just wanna be upping one of the variables. So for me, it's weight. On um, a small movement, like a shrug, you, you might get away for ages with putting five kilos on every week. 
um, on a smaller isolation movement, say a side lateral raise, small muscle, long lever. You know, you might be stuck on the same weight for a couple of weeks. It's hard to advance something, so it, it varies, but try to do the maximum increment that you can. One little tip I've got is on a selectorized, select, selectorized stack, you know, you've got the weights and you put the pin in, they're normally like five kilos, so I'll maybe hang up one and a quarter kilos on the pin, and in that way you, you can take a month to go up to the next one. You know, and your body can do the small, regular little increments like that. You know, a kilo don't sound like a lot. A year later, you're lifting 50 kilos more, it is huge, so don't let that put you off. You can get the little micro discs, which we have in our gym. There's half kilo, a quarter of a kilo, and an eighth of a kilo. So again, even with an Olympic bar, you can micro load, you know. Gains to expect? Well, all depends on how much of a caloric surplus you're in, how quickly you're putting the muscle on. Certainly by the end of the second year, like you've gained, you would have gained the quickest in that first two years. Certainly by year five, you'd have pretty much plateaued and gains are gonna be pretty minimal after that point. If you'd like to take all the guesswork out of your nutrition and workout planning, hit me up at henshubofall.com and we can chat. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Go vegan for victory.